Welcome to the Healthy Heart Show, where we pull back the curtain on conventional medicine and dive into the root causes of cardiovascular health. If you are concerned about high cholesterol, high blood pressure, heart attacks, stroke, or atrial fibrillation, this is the place for you. We will provide natural heart information that will help you prevent, treat, and reverse any ailment, leaving pills and procedures out of the picture. Here are your guides to holistic heart health, board-certified cardiologist and Amazon best-selling author, Dr. Jack Wolfson, and natural heart doctor, naturopathic physician, Dr. Lauren Latanza. Hello, everyone. Dr. Jack Wolfson, board-certified cardiologist. Welcome to another episode of The Healthy Heart Show, where we try and give you the best heart health information so you can lead your best life and ultimately obtain that 100-year heart. And if you're thinking about the 100-year heart, there is no greater authority to get you there than my guest today on this podcast. This is Dr. Stephen Gundry. First of all, let me say hello, Dr. Gundry. Hey, thanks for having me on The Healthy Heart Show. Appreciate it. Great, uh, great to have you here. And again, you know, if you don't know Dr. Gundry, I don't know where you've been. Certainly, you've not been uh, uh, looking at, at actual health. Maybe if you've only been listening to your traditional medical doctor's opinions, uh, you're not going to hear about Dr. Gundry. But since you're here on my show, you likely have. Well, listen, he is one of the world's top cardiothoracic surgeons and a pioneer in nutrition, as well as a, the medical director at the International Heart and Lung Institute Center for Restorative Medicine. And that's in Palm Springs, Palm Desert. Yes. Palm Springs and also Santa Barbara. And Good also place. in Santa Barbara. So two phenomenal locations to go visit. He spent the last two decades studying the microbiome and now helps patients use diet and nutrition as a key form of treatment. He's the author of many New York Times bestselling books, including, of course, The Plant Paradox, which was the original that just really just changed so many people's minds as to, as to I thought all plants were actually healthy and plant-based was the way to go. And now you read Plant Paradox and you're like, wait a second. Uh, that's the point. There is a paradox to the benefits of eating plants and contrary to what many people would think. Uh, of course, the cookbooks, then he comes up with the longevity uh, paradox, the energy paradox. And now the latest that we're going to dive into is unlocking the keto code, which I have read. And it is, it, it is just groundbreaking. And whatever you think you know about keto, if you're into keto, uh, you're going to learn a lot from, from reading Dr. Gundry's uh, new book. He's also the founder of Gundry MD. When he's got a full line of wellness products, supplements, and he's the host of the Dr. Gundry podcast. And Dr. Gundry, this isn't even talking about all of your accolades as a cardiovascular surgeon, right? So, right. Uh, uh, help me out here. Uh, uh, tell me, tell me some of your some of your backstory of again. You know, what was your interest in becoming a cardiovascular surgeon? Your life as a surgeon. Tell me about your your uh, nutritional and wellness training as a cardiovascular surgeon. Well, actually, I, I decided to become a doctor uh, at age ten after reading a book in my uh, grade school library called "All About You." And uh, I actually, that was the day I decided to, to be a doctor and never looked back. I was blessed by having uh, some great mentors in medical school at the Medical College of Georgia in Augusta, who literally took me under their arm, a, a wonderful pediatric cardiologist um, who uh, kind of made me see patients all the time. And he says, you know, you're going to be a great pediatric cardiologist. And I said, well, you know, I love to find out what's wrong, but I think I like fixing what's wrong better. And so uh, my mentor, uh, Robert Ellison, um, said, you got to go to the University of Michigan and get trained. And uh, when I got to the University of Michigan, I met one of the fellow residents who was just the best surgeon I'd ever met. I said, gee, you know, how'd you get so good? And he says, oh, uh, you know, I went to the NIH and trained with Dr. Morrow. And I said, well, how do I do that? And I said, well, he said, well, you know, go, um, go interview. So I had blessed by being a research fellow at the NIH for several years. And then I was blessed to get into the hospital for sick children at Great Ormond Street, London, England, to do my children's heart surgery training. And uh, long story short, I was eventually recruited to become professor and chairman at Loma Linda University School of Medicine uh, nearby here in, in Loma Linda, California, which, by the way, is the only blue zone in the United States. And interestingly enough, I'm the only nutritionist who's actually spent most of his career uh, living in a blue zone. So I think I could talk about blue zones. Uh, 
Anyhow, I actually got interested in nutrition uh, when I was an undergraduate at Yale, where back in those dark ages, uh, we could actually design our own major and uh, defend a thesis, very much like doing a master's program in, as an undergraduate. And my thesis was that you could take a great ape, manipulate its food supply, manipulate its environment, and prove that you would arrive at a human being. And long story short, uh, after four years of research, I defended my thesis, got an honors, uh, gave it to my parents, and went away and became a very famous heart surgeon. Um, pioneered minimally invasive heart surgery. My partner and I, Leonard Bailey, pioneered infant pediatric heart transplantation. I invented a way of protecting the heart which is still used in almost every operation in the world, uh, Gundry retrograde, cardioplegia catheter. So uh, fast forward, as a very famous heart surgeon, I was one of those people that people who had inoperable coronary artery disease would come to visit from all over the country to try and talk people like me into operating on them, which was usually a hopeless case. And, you know, there were a few of us idiots. And uh, so I met a gentleman who I call Big Ed in, in all my books. He's a real guy from Miami, Florida. He was 48 years old, had literally inoperable coronary artery disease. Every blood vessel was so clogged up. You couldn't put stents in. There wasn't any place to put a bypass beyond a blockage because everything was clogged. And he like many people, would go around the country to very famous centers, and everybody he visited uh, turned him down. Said, yeah, nothing we can do for it. Have a nice day. He did this for six months, and he ended up in my office, and I looked at his angiogram from six months earlier, and I said, you know, I really don't like to turn down people, but I agree with everybody else. I'm not going to be able to help you. Sorry. And he said, look, you know, this has been six months now. I've been on a diet for these six months. I've, I've lost 45 pounds in six months. Now, he's big Ed because he weighed 265 pounds when I met him. Um, so he had been over 300 pounds. And he says, I've, been, I've, I've gone to a health food store and I've been taking all of these supplements. And he literally brings in a shopping bag of, of supplements. And he said, you know, maybe I did something in here. And, you know, I'm scratching my professor beard and going, well, you know, good for you by losing weight, but that's not going to do anything, you know, in your coronary arteries. And I know what you did with those supplements. You made expensive urine. Uh, you wasted all your money. And I firmly believe that, like you probably believe, uh, because that's the way you and I were trained. Um, you know, you and I got a couple hours of nutrition. And it was basically, this is a fat, this is a protein, and this is a carbohydrate, end of lecture. And here's some vitamins that, you know, we know you need, but the USDA has you know, given the limits of these things and, you know, have a nice day. So Big Ed talked me into doing an angiogram of him. And lo and behold, in six months time, this guy had cleaned out 50% of the blockages in his heart. I mean, gone. I'd never seen anything like that. I uh, never heard of anything like that. Even when we looked at high dose statin trials, we talk about a statistical significance of a, of a 0.1% reduction in plaque burden and think that's the greatest thing of all time. And yet here's a guy who's literally you know, reduced his plaque burden by 50%. Blockages are gone, six months. So uh, I asked him to describe the diet that he was on. And long story short, he basically kind of read verbatim my research project at Yale University, my thesis. Uh, and primarily, quite frankly, a plant-based diet, but very different plant-based diet based on evolution. And then I looked at his supplements. And like I mentioned, I'm famous for keeping a heart alive for heart transplants and during heart surgery. And I was putting all sorts of funny compounds down the veins and arteries of the heart to protect them. And lo and behold, a lot of these compounds he was swallowing. And it never occurred to me to swallow these things. So I was a big fat guy, even though I was running 30 miles a week, going to the gym 
one hour every day eating a healthy, low fat diet because everybody knows that that's what you're supposed to do. And I had high cholesterol, prediabetes, hypertension, migraine headaches, arthritis so bad I wore braces on my knees to run and figured eh, that's, you know, that's my genetics. And when I started putting myself on my own program, I lost 50 pounds my first year, subsequently lost another 20 pounds and have kept it off for 25 years. So the biggest mistake I made was people I would operate on, uh, I put them on this program. And uh, lo and behold, uh, their diabetes regressed, their hypertension regressed, their arthritis regressed. And so after about a year of doing this at Loma Linda, uh, I had an epiphany one Friday morning looking in the mirror before I went to work. I said, you know, I've got this all wrong. I shouldn't operate on people and teach them how to eat so they'll avoid me in the future. I said, I got to teach them how to eat so I never have to operate on. Now, as a career choice for a heart surgeon, that's, that's really dumb. I mean, that's really dumb, as my wife would remind me for many, many years. So I literally resigned my position and uh, set up a clinic in Palm Springs and subsequently in, in Santa Barbara, where I'm a researcher. So I said, look, folks, uh, I want to tell you not to eat some certain foods. Uh, I want to send you to Costco or Trader Joe's or the health food store, and I want you to buy some supplements. I want to draw your blood every three months, and let's see what happens. And then, lo and behold, we saw what happened. I started publishing my results at the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology. Etc. And that resulted in uh, probably, you know, my most famous book, The Plant Paradox, um, where I made the case that the, the, a lot of the healthy foods you think are good for you or, you know, are killing you. And here's what to do. And it spent almost a year on the New York Times bestseller list. It's still a bestseller on Amazon. And um, the rest is history. No, that's uh, uh, fantastic. Uh, and I think, you know, again, uh, you know, again, the, the cardiovascular surgeons, you know, it's like you get to, you know, it's like the top of the cardiovascular, the top of the uh, uh, health educational food chain. I mean, such notoriety. When I was a, uh, when I was a young single cardiologist in Arizona and I first got out there and I was hanging out with a guy who was the cardiovascular surgeon and kind of, I would always defer to him if we'd be out and in public and talking with people and maybe talking to a couple of women, I'd say, well, I'm a cardiologist, but he's the surgeon. Like, you know, he's, <laughs> he's the real deal guy. He's but top gun. <laughs> he, is, he, is, he is top gun. And certainly in the heart world, uh, you know, so again, uh, and I think, you know, it, just like you said, it is such the epiphany moment, but also where your wife would come in and say, you know what? Uh, more than likely, you're doing very well financially as a cardiovascular surgeon and myself doing very well financially as a cardiologist, as a senior partner in the biggest group in the state of Arizona. And to leave that uh, and to, number one, uh, you know, allow yourself to have that epiphany to say, well, hey, there's a better way uh, and a different way to tackle cardiovascular disease and give people the best uh, but then also write the financial ramifications of that jump. But I'm sure myself, like you, you look in the mirror and say, hey, um, you know, I, 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 I'm about a bigger purpose than just, you yeah. know, than just the paycheck. And, and, you know, to have children, I've got four children and proverbially, right, on your deathbed, you look at your children and say, well, you know, I did it this way. I should have done it this way, but I was worried about the money. So I stuck with it. Yeah. <laughs> Let me uh, let me ask you this now. Back in the year two thousand, maybe you were there. I'm a, I was a fellow, and I was down in Orlando, and I saw a debate between the late Robert Adkins and Dean Ornish, and they they were up on stage, as you know, in front of thousands and thousands of people, each staking their claim and. Uh, from what I could tell, like those guys hated each other. Like, I mean, there, there was a serious disdain, uh, you know, for them. And that was kind of my first introduction really into nutrition and even the conversation. And I was already a cardiology fellow by that point. So four years of osteopathic medical school, three years internal medicine. And, you know, now I'm a cardiology fellow and I hear that uh, and I hear that debate. So, again, coming from you, such, you know, such an authority to see what you've seen. Let me ask you, because I know you talk about this uh, in, in your new book as well, where you talk about time restricted feeding. 
and yep. how benefit beneficial that is. And we we in our office and our team we talk about that you know about the sunshine schedule. So making sure you're eating certainly within you know that's when it's sunny outside, when it's light outside, never eating when it's dark. But my thought on this, I think you you really summed it up with your patient. If we go into fasting, and what about even prolonged fasting where we do 24, 36, 72 hour fasting, and now the body is looking for food for fuel, will it start to break down coronary artery plaque and calcifications because it needs, it needs fuel. And at the end of the day, I can't imagine the body would defer to break down brain and muscle tissue. It's gonna break down fat. It's going to break down things that it deems unnecessary. And I would think plaque would be, would be part of that. Yeah, that's a, that's a good observation. Um, you know, wh whenever we're starving, uh, we obviously kind of don't care about unnecessary parts of us. Uh, I see a number of people, particularly women, who go on a, a fairly vigorous weight reduction di diet, and that can include fasting, and their, their hair thins out, and their hair kind of falls out, and they, they panic, and they go, oh my gosh, you know, my thyroid, it's my thyroid. And we look at their thyroid numbers and they're fabulous. And I said, look, your body is saying, hey, you know, this is this is expendable. I have no need for hair. It requires protein to make. And so for a while, we're just going to cut back on hair production because we need it for better, other things. I think the same thing uh, holds true, uh, certainly for uh, plaque and coronary arteries. Uh, I happen to think there's even a, a bigger driving factor. For instance, um, any of us who uh, do weights or use barbells and are married and have a wedding ring, you know, we develop calluses on either side of our wedding ring. And those calluses are layer and layer and layer of you know, dead skin, basically, to protect against the trauma. And one of my arguments that I actually learned from Michael DeBakey was that we put calluses on our coronary arteries because of to protect against inflammation and that callus keeps getting deposited and what i learned from big ed is if you no longer have a driver of inflammation which i personally think comes from leaky gut then there's no need for those calluses and they regress so i think that's another way of looking at the same thing you're saying yeah, leaky gut, you know, when I first met my wife, who would kind of uh, pull me out of the matrix, if you will, open up my eyes back in 2005. Um, and at that time, you know, I'll tell you, Dr. Gundry, my, you know, again, obviously, we see, you know, sickness all around us. And I saw sickness in my own father, who uh, is, is a cardiologist, he uh, developed a Parkinson's like illness called progressive supranuclear palsy. And my father was a cardiologist. I was following in his footsteps. And when I met my wife and she said, if you, you know, you got to change all these things, if you want to, you know, avoid uh, becoming, uh, become like, like your father, father. One of the, you know, and, and, and it got my attention because how he suffered and died was, was absolutely cruel. My father was the first DO at the Cleveland clinic. He was the first DO at uh, university of Iowa uh, in 1972. Hmm. Um, and in any case, um, when I met my wife, that's one of the things she talked about was leaky gut. And I said, leaky gut, where'd you come up with that bogus chiropractic diagnosis? And she said, go read about it. But as that extends, right, it's like, well, you went to go read about it. There wasn't much to read. You would talk to people. It made sense. But as you know, obviously, over the last 10 to 15 years, the literature is very effusive about uh, leaky gut and, of course, the ability to test for it now. And I applaud you. You know, what you just said certainly is that if we have that leaky gut, things get into the body, you know, the immune system activates, inflammation, oxidative stress, uh, leaky heart, uh, of course, uh, leaky brain, and so on and so forth. So, uh, and, and I think, you know, one of the things you, I mean, you talk about various things in your new book also that as it pertains to factors that would lead uh, uh, to uh, leaky gut. And, um, you know, maybe again, I think also, you know, if you would talk about, you know, because in your book, you really break down so, so amazingly this whole idea of, of ketones are not what we think they are, uh, or in the sense of how they work, uh, but it's actually due to this thing called mitochondrial uncoupling. Yeah, that's a, I, I wish I 
I spent about six months uh, while working on the manuscript trying to figure out another way of saying uh, mitochondrial uncoupling. Uh, unfortunately, the literature is actually full of a description of what uncoupling uh, mitochondria means. And I finally gave up and I said, look, you know, this is what it's called and I'm going to have to stick with it. I'm going to have to explain what the heck that is. Uh, and I spend actually quite a fun time in the book uh, talking about how the uh, mitochondria, particularly the electron transport chain in mitochondria, and for I'm sure your listeners already know, but mitochondria are the energy producing organelles in, in almost all of our cells. And uh, they're actually uh, engulfed bacteria that were engulfed two billion years ago that took up residence in our cells. And they have the unique ability, they have their own DNA. And so they can grow and divide. Um, within a cell without the cell dividing, which is really important to understand the effect of ketones and uncoupling. So normally um, making energy, making ATP is very hard, dangerous work. Uh, it involves energizing electrons and protons, kind of pushing them down a gauntlet uh, within the inner mitochondrial membrane called the electron transport chain. And, and I call it the mito club in the book. It's the hottest place to be for uh, millennials and Gen Zers. You're looking to go to the mito club, the club to couple with uh, a partner. Uh, with the hopes of leaving the club for exciting times or later that night and maybe in the future. And so you're trying to couple up. And in this club, we are actually trying to couple protons with oxygen molecules. And that coupling uh, generates ATP as this couple leaves the back door of the mito club. And that actually generates ATP. It's pretty cool. Unfortunately, there's also lots of other people that want to couple. Uh, electrons would, be, would love to couple with oxygen as well. But when electrons couple with oxygen, you get free radicals and reactive oxygen species, which are actually pretty dangerous characters. We have a really unique antioxidant system in mitochondria, basically bouncers in a club that try to keep this level of craziness under control. And one of the interesting things I learned in researching this is there are only two mitochondrial anti antioxidants. One of them surprises everybody, and it's melatonin, the sleep hormone. And I argue in the book that we should stop considering melatonin a sleep hormone and consider it the most effective mit mitochondrial antioxidant there is. And number two, glut glutathione. All the other things we call antioxidants like vitamin C and vitamin E, in fact, have not only no influence in my, mitochondrial antioxidant status, but may actually be harmful, but that's another subject. So uh, things are steamy in the club, things get out of hand, there's hormones raging, there's beer and other mixed drinks and people are drunk, punches are being thrown and there has to be a way to release this pressure. There's only so many people who are gonna couple up. So we have a unique design that was discovered actually in 1978 that there should be emergency exits in mitochondria so that we could literally blow off pressure in the mitochondria to protect the mitochondria from damage. Very much like a pressure cooker has a release valve so that the pressure and the pressure cooker gets too high, you know, the steam starts escaping and it escapes until the pressure is under control again. Uh, my mother blew up a pressure cooker when I was growing up. It was really exciting. I still remember it uh, everywhere on the ceiling. Uh, those were the good old days. So we now know that we have these pressure release valves and they're controlled by what are called uncoupling proteins. And we actually have five pressure release valves. Now what's fascinating, so we uncouple protons from oxygen 
so that we don't make as much ATP as possible. Now, what's really surprising is at rest, you and me, 30% of all the fuel entering our mitochondria to produce ATP never makes it into ATP production, but is instead uncoupled and released through these emergency exits, through these pressure release valves, 30%. Now you say, wow, you know, what a stupid design uh, for an animal that you got to eat 30 more, 30 more calories to generate the amount of ATP you need. Uh, why? You know, we don't do things stupidly. Uh, and it turns out that when we release these pressure valves, it generates heat and we're warm blooded animals. And so the heat production is part of that. And in fact, cold-blooded animals actually aren't cold-blooded. They still have to have a basal temperature. So even cold-blooded animals use uh, mitochondrial uncoupling to generate heat. One of the best examples is most people now know about brown fat. Uh, brown fat is brown and it's heat-producing fat. It has so many mitochondria that when we look at it under the microscope, it literally looks brown because it's so packly dense densely packed with mitochondria. And these guys uncouple aggressively and create heat and waste calories. So that's a long-winded way of saying, okay, so what do ketones do? Well, I and others, uh, and I have uh, a fun time uh, so showing some quotes from well-known keto experts, uh, published quotes, and I don't give their names out to protect my friends, uh, but you know, ketones are the perfect fuel. Uh, glucose is a dirty fuel. Uh, ketones are clean burning fuel. Uh, the liver loves ketones, et cetera, et cetera. Um, when you become keto adapted, you become efficient fat burner. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. Um, ketones are produced number one, when we're starving and when we're starving, we normally would release free fatty acids from our fat cells, which can be used as a fuel by every cell in our body with one exception. Free fatty acids are big fat lipid molecules that are fat soluble, and they can't get through the blood brain barrier into our brain. Uh, they can, but it's a really slow process. So what happens is if we're lucky, uh, these free fatty acids go to our liver, the liver converts them into short chain fatty acids, which are water soluble called ketones or ketone bodies. The liver can't use ketones. So the liver throws them out back into circulation where they get through the blood brain barrier and the brain can temporarily use ketones to basically hold the line, stay alive until better times arrive. The original ketone diet, ketogenic diet, was actually uh, discovered and actually named at the Mayo Clinic in the 1930s as a treatment for seizure disorders in kids. And sadly, it was noted that kids who had severe seizure disorders were in a post-ictal state so many times that they were literally starving. And when they were having all these seizures, the more they kind of weren't eating, their seizures abated until they started eating again. And then their seizures came right back. And smart researchers at Boston and then Mayo said, whoa, there's something about these kids starving that's turning off their seizures. And they stuck upon ketone bodies. And so the original ketogenic diet was an 80% fat diet a 10% carbohydrate diet and a 10% protein diet. And it was actually quite miraculous in treating childhood seizures. And this was before Dilantin and Phenobarb and all the other ones. And it did great up until these drugs came along and the, the diet fell out by the wayside. Why? Because as those of us who have kids and now grandkids uh, know it is really hard to get a kid not to eat carbohydrates. Um, Kids are carbohydrate-seeking you know, missiles, and it's really hard to stop them. And that was one of the downsides of the diet. So fast forward to the 80s and 90s, 
when a lot of kids did not do well on anti-seizure medications. They struggled in school, their brains didn't work right. So people said, gee, what if we used a different form of fat? And that is MCT oil, medium chain triglycerides. Medium chain triglycerides are unique in that they're absorbed directly from our gut and go to the liver directly where they're converted automatically into ketones. So what was amazing was you could put kids on an MCT oil diet, much less fat, far more carbohydrates, far more proteins, and you'd get the same effect as if they were eating a high fat ketogenic diet. Why? Because the MCTs automatically produce ketones, even if the kids were eating a lot of carbohydrates. And I joke, and I'm not recommending this, you could eat a fresh fruit salad, please don't, and have a couple tablespoons of MCT oil, and you will generate ketones despite being overwhelmed by glucose from the and fructose from the fruit. So that actually got me fascinated. Uh, and I went back and looked at, I've been having my patients do a ketogenic diet for cancer, for uh, dementia, for uh, diabetes, prediabetes, and it's been very effective. And yet uh, it was based on an MCT oil-based diet and actually quite a lot of carbohydrates. If you look at my ketogenic diet, there's a lot of carbs in that diet. And yet it was very effective. And I could show that people were in ketosis. Uh, and so I went back and went, son of a gun, I'm so stupid. Um, these ketones are doing something completely different than what I thought. And lo and behold, when you start looking at how ketones work, uh, you realize that ketones weren't the super fuel that all of us were taught. In fact, work uh, from Harvard by George Cahill and Dr. Owens and from the NIH by Dr. Veach show that even at full ketosis in humans, uh, we will only get 30% of our energy needs met by burning ketones. 70% uh, has to come from free fatty acids and also glucose. Even at full ketosis, the brain will only use 60% or 70% get its needs met by ketones. And it still needs 30 to 40% glucose as a fuel. So the idea that these are a super fuel, sorry, is not true. I'm sorry. Um, but they're doing something super cool. So what is that? And in a roundabout way, what they do, they're signaling compounds. And they're signaling molecules that tell mitochondria to actually aggressively uncouple, uncouple joining oxygen to protons to make ATP. And one of the real epiphanies in, in this search was a, a small paper written by Dr. Martin Brand in the year 2000. And the paper is called Uncoupling to Survive. And I recommend all your viewers and listeners dig up the paper, Google it. It's easy to find, Uncoupling to Survive. And he makes the ludicrous statement, which is actually true, that if you're starving to death, the only thing worth saving is your mitochondria because your mitochondria make energy. And if the mitochondria die, who cares about anything else? You're, you're dead. So mitochondria, if ketones are present, will be told to protect themselves at all costs. And since making ATP is so damaging to mitochondria, he showed that you would anticipate that starvation and ketones would tell mitochondria to aggressively uncouple, blow off pressure to protect themselves but in the process of which you would tell mitochondria to make more of themselves, to divide, to handle the workload. Uh, now, what do I mean by that? We could hook one dog to a dog sled, and yes, the dog could pull the sled. Uh, he wouldn't do very well at it, but he'd get the job done, and he don't, you don't have to feed one dog. On the other hand, you could hook six dogs to a dog sled, 
each dog would have to do a sixth of the work that that single dog did. And you go a lot farther, but the dogs would have to eat more than that single dog. And so what he said was each mitochondria would have to do a whole lot less work. We'd get damaged less, but you'd recruit lots of more mitochondria to help with the workload. So you could produce the same ATP that you would, but each dog would have far less. But in the consequence is you'd actually become fuel wasting. And so the weight loss from a ketogenic diet is actually because mitochondria are just wasting fuel. And I use the analogy, you become a Ferrari rather than a Toyota Prius. The Healthy Heart Show will be right back after we take this quick break to hear from our sponsor. Would you like to drink great tasting coffee that's also good for your heart health? Cardiology Coffee is your answer. This five-star rated coffee is delicious. It's a gourmet coffee that begins with whole organic beans, hand-selected, and carefully roasted. It's tested and certified to be free of pesticides, mold, and other toxins. Cardiology Coffee is great for your heart, and you're going to love how it tastes. Order now online at cardiologycoffee.com. Now back to the Healthy Heart Show. Yeah, and I don't think I've read that before in other, you know, keto theory books and, and whatnot. Um, and again, nope. to me, and to me like that, to me, that never really jived as a long-term solution anyways. Again, like I wrote my book in 2015 called The Paleo Cardiologist. And if we use that hunter-gatherer wisdom, another friend of mine, Bill Schindler, wrote a book called Eat Like a Human. He's a PhD researcher on the East Coast. And I think he, what he really talks about is how we can take any foods and make um, healthier versions of themselves like our ancestors, you know, did. And I think that really plays in a lot with a lot of your recommendations, your recipes uh, to open up a lot more options than people going extreme, you know, keto or jumping into a carnivore, uh, you know, approach. And I'm certainly, I mean, to me, the healthiest food on the planet is seafood. And I know you're a Loma Linda guy. So when you talk about the Seventh Day of Venice and everybody try, and all the vegans want to trot out uh, you know, hey, you know, look at these, look at these vegans over here. The people who lived the longest, as you know, were the women who ate seafood. Uh, so I, you know, again, eating lots of seafood, I think really plays in a lot to what you're saying. Is, is certainly as you talk in the book about the essential fatty acids, uh, the book is, you know, you're talking about obviously extremely con uh, complicated concepts, even to the cardiovascular surgeon and the cardiologist, when you start diving into, you know, really quantum biology and quantum physics, but you've made such an, you made it very simple to understand, like you said, with your analogies of, uh, you know, the Mito club and, and the bouncers and the patron patrons. So for those of you who are listening right now, and you're thinking this is a lot, again, Dr. Gundry goes a long way towards simplifying it. And then boom, he gets us right into the useful tips and strategies about how there's many other things you can use to, mito to uncouple mito the mitochondria. Uh, so that information is all fantastic. Let me ask you real quick, um, MCT oil, I believe your, your approach is you're not into using coconut oil, A, and to talk about coconut oil, because again, that's where MCTs are located. Talk about coconut oil and talk about some of these other exogenous ketone products that are yeah. of course sprung up all over. Yeah, um, the problem with coconut oil, first of all, um, I got very interested in the APOE4 genotype as, as a heart surgeon, because uh, uh, we've known, and you as a cardiologist know, that the APOE4 folks uh, really uh, not only uh, are predisposed to uh, dementia, Alzheimer's, but are also predisposed to coronary artery disease, vascular disease in general. And uh, I got very interested coming at that direction of learning about the mischief of the APOE4 gene. Uh, my now good friend, Dr. Dale Bredesen, who wrote The End of Alzheimer's, of course, approached the APOE4 from a neurology standpoint. And it, it's really funny. We've become good friends because... He came at it from one direction for the brain. I came at it from the heart. And we, when we first were introduced a number of years ago, we, you know, I said, oh, my God, you know, Dr. Bredesen, big fan, read everything you've read, written. He said, oh, you know, Dr. Gundry, big fan. I've read everything you read. 
So the Apple E4 got both of us interested in the effect of certain fat saturated fats uh, on increasing small dense LDLs and increasing the oxidation of small dense LDLs. And I hope everyone realizes that the cholesterol theory of heart disease is just a theory. And there are multiple other really good theories of heart disease, some of which I like better than the cholesterol theory. But uh, I do, if you like the cholesterol theory of heart disease, then I think we should be attuned to whether or not cholesterol particles are oxidized, whether they're rusty or rancid. Um, and I noticed through the years that my patients who ate a lot of saturated fats, including coconut oil, uh, definitely had much higher numbers of small dense LDLs, regardless of what else they were eating, and would also oxidize their cholesterol. So coconut oil was often right up there on the top of the things I banned. Now, you're correct, uh, MCTs, uh, the ketogenic parts of MCTs, particularly the C8 and the C10, are a small portion of coconut oil. And the nice thing about MCTs is that they have no effect on changing cholesterol profiles because they're handled in a totally different way than these large C12s, lauric acid, which constitutes a great deal of coconut oil. And that was actually an epiphany for me a number of years ago when I put my insulin resistant folks on my ketogenic diet with MCTs and lo and behold, uh, it didn't have an effect on oxidation. In fact, they got better and they didn't have an effect on small dense LDLs. So they're very different. The, the more people can use uh, C8 uh, the better. If they get a mixture of C8 and C10, they're great. But C12s really have no effect. Uh, how about C6? Unfortunately, C6 smells like goats, and it's pretty nasty stuff. In answer to your second question, the nice thing about MCTs, as I talk about in the book, the vast majority of people in the United States are insulin resistant, have no metabolic flexibility, and so if they go on a high fat, low carb ketogenic diet, it may take them two, three, four weeks to actually drop their insulin levels low enough that they can begin liberate uh, free fatty acids from fat. And this is where the Adkin blues come from, the keto flu comes from, you just can't get to all that fat. So the beauty of MCTs is that you can generate ketones even in the presence of insulin resistance. And that can kind of keep your brain going until you finally do liberate free fatty acids. Now, the ketone products, the ketone esters, um, and I've tried them all, uh, they are pretty doggone nasty. You, know, you pretty much have to hold your nose to, to, to do the shot. Uh, and they're really expensive. The ketone salts are cheaper. They're uh, fairly flavorful. They're where they're constituted. But to get the continuous ketone effect, you got to take these multiple times a day. And you're going to actually get a pretty impressive sodium load uh, by the end of the day if you were taking enough of them. So, yeah, they're, they're an option. I talk about them in the book. They're a quick start option. But for the money, and the power, you're better off with MCTs. And I love the fact too, that in the book, I came across the word berberine and I talk about berberine. It's like whenever, whenever somebody has any health ailment, <laughs> whether it's prostate cancer or it's dementia uh, or sarcoidosis, um, uh, you know, whatever it may be, you get into pubmed.gov and you search berberine in the diagnosis and it comes up. And I love the fact that you talk about berberine as a mitochondrial uncoupler. I thought that was uh, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. You know, a lot of people call, you know, berberine a, a poor man's metformin. And in a, in a lot of ways, it acts very similar to metformin. And interestingly enough, metformin in and of itself is a mitochondrial uncoupler. So uh, things keep coming around to uncoupling mitochondria. Yeah, I think uh, personally, I would uh, actually reverse that, right? Metformin is the poor man's uh, berberine from, uh, uh, from what I can tell. I, I agree. Uh, I, 
I certainly have a lot of colleagues in longevity that take metformin. I, I don't. Um, I, I take berberine and I do a lot of other tricks. Uh, I guess I don't have any problem with my, my friends taking metformin, but just seems to me there's better ways to do this. Yeah, most certainly. And I think sometimes, you know, me personally, when I've gone to some of these, you know, bigger meetings and you hear some of these speakers and they almost talk about like their, their pharmaceutical cocktail for anti-aging. And it's like, yeah, there's just, there, there's got to be a better way. And of course, uh, you know, hopefully you and I would agree that, yeah, you know, when you're making comments like that about you take berberine versus your colleagues who take the, you know, pharmaceutical that I think, you know, we're in agreement that, hey, our bodies are built to last. If you give it what it needs, take away what it doesn't. We're good to go. All right, listen, yeah. I want, um, I appreciate, you know, your time. I do want to, and, and again, for everybody who's listening, again, we talked about, you know, Dr. Gundry's book, Unlocking the Keto Code. Uh, it's available starting in March of 2022. So again, go grab that, give it to someone that you love. Uh, my whole team, they're going to read uh, uh, your book as well, because again, there's just phenomenal information uh, you know, just when you think you thought you knew everything about keto, it turns out you know nothing about keto. So that's what the book is great for. Um, <laughs> let's get into a little controversy again. Um, sure. You, you, uh, you publish a, a study, uh, and the study essentially where you're looking at a large number of patients and you're looking at the effects of the COVID shot and inflammation by a certain form of test. Um, and do me a favor, tell, tell us, I guess, what was your interest in doing that study? What were the results and what were the, the ramifications of your findings? Yeah, so uh, we use a, a test that's been clinically validated that the clinic, clinic uses as well called the PULSE test, P-U-L-S. And the PULSE test uh, gives a five-year risk of having acute coronary syndrome. Um, unstable angina or a heart attack or needing a stent or a bypass. And uh, again, it's clinically validated. Cleveland Clinic uses it. I've been using it for many, many years. And uh, this test, after uh, when the mRNA vaccines came out, we noticed, uh, my PA and I noticed that, holy cow, uh, all of a sudden, this uh, predictive value of having a heart attack in the next five years uh, doubled uh, in most people. And when we looked at the various markers that this test measures, three distinct markers went up uh, 95% of people who got the mRNA vaccines. One was a marker IL-16, which literally looks at inflammation on the surface of blood vessels. Another one called human growth, hepatic growth factor, which really has nothing to do with the liver. It actually has to do with myocardial inflammation. And another one called FAS. Uh, these all three went up. When the second shot came in, they went up even higher. And it was consistent across the board. Now, interestingly enough, we didn't see it very much with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is a different technology. So we started tracking this and we tracked it for about a year. And I said, you know, this is actually scary and somebody has to say something about this. So uh, literally on the last day to submit the abstract, to the annual meeting of the American Heart Association, I pulled the trigger and submitted my abstract. But I did it in a way that I thought they would reject it. I didn't put any statistics in the paper. And I thought for sure the lack of statistics would you know, put a red flag on it and they'd just reject it. And then I could live with myself. Yeah, I tried to tell people, well, lo and behold, the program committee accepted it uh, for a presentation. And I'm going, oh, great. So it got published. And uh, immediately, the uh, let's just say the anti-vax community went hog wild. Um, it became you know, the paper that proved what everybody was trying to say. Uh, apparently, I became best friends with Robert F. Kennedy Jr., but that's another story. And so almost like the day after it was published, uh, the American Heart Association put a red flag on the paper 
saying, uh, there's some questions about this paper and we're going to remove it until the questions are resolved. And it had to do with a couple of misspellings. I, I, I write all my own papers, my own abstracts. Uh, you know, I do spell check and sometimes spell check miss. Um, every one of the books I write, um, we have two proofreaders, me and my editor, and we still miss miss misspellings. It's pretty hilarious. So anyhow, but that's why they flagged it. And so they wrote me a letter and from the chairman of the program committee he said, you know, you have to answer all these questions uh, in 24 hours or we're pulling the paper. And I'm going, whoa, you know, this is, this is pretty impressive. So I answered all their questions. I said, look, you know, I'm not some Joe Blow practicing, you know, restorative medicine. I used to be on the program committee of the American Heart Association. I used to be on the program committee of the American College of Cardiology. I know how this system works. You know, I graded papers. You know, I'm, I was a professor and chairman, blah, blah, blah. And I said, I'm not, I'm not the bad guy here, but we're supposed to do no harm. And the American Heart Association is supposed to look out for the hearts of people. And I said, this is, you know, I'm sorry that this is what it says, but that's why we need to go forward. And so I toned them down. They said, yeah, but we're going to, we got to damp down this, this language. So I get a cold, cold call from the CEO of the pulse test, who is a physician. And he says, Hey, um, saw your paper. Thank you very much. Uh, we had a paper in progress that shows exactly the same thing with all of our patients across all the various people who use this. And thank you so much for publishing this because now the heat's off of us. But I just wanted to assure you that you're correct. This is exactly what we see. And he said, it should be as no surprise because you're telling the body to produce the spike protein which is the inflammatory protein that causes the cytokine storm. And he says, it should be of no surprise to anybody. So I went back to the American Heart Association as chairman. We kind of became good friends, I guess. Um, and I said, you know, here, he'll, he'll send you the data. He, and I said, we got to let people know. And he said, no, he says, that's not our job. Uh, the FDA and the CDC is looking out for people's uh, effects. That's not your job and it's not my job. And he said, you either need to, you know, dilute this paper to nothing or we're pulling it. And so uh, this went on for about three weeks. And finally we arrived at a diluted paper that at least got the point out. But, and I, so I'd call the guy from Pulse and I said, Hey, you know, what's the, what's the deal? Why, why this pushback? He said, really, are you that dumb? He said, where do you think the funding for the American heart comes from? And where do you think this professor's funding comes from? And he said, yeah, I said, oh, please don't tell me. And he said, yeah. And so, yeah, it, there was tremendous pushback on this. I can imagine. I mean, again, just yeah, as you comb through the, uh, you know, the pages of any of these medical journals, right? I mean, every other page is an advertisement from a pharmaceutical company. So, uh, you know, right, and if it's in... Uh, the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, if it's not to protect the public's, you know, interest, I mean, what is, yeah, what, what is, what, you know, what is their mandate? And again, they only exist uh, at this point in time, you know, probably for the last hundred years, right? Just to uh, put forth the efforts of pharmaceutical companies. So again, I, I applaud you for, for sticking your neck out there for that paper. Uh, and again, for me, you know, most of my, most of my patients, clients, uh, did not get uh, any shot, but those who did, maybe didn't, who didn't get my memo, we saw uh, uh, two strokes, we saw cardiac arrests, we saw myocardial infarction. Obviously, whenever you stimulate inflammation, you're going to see a lot of AFib, a lot of yep, PVCs, a lot of AFib. PVCs. We saw a ton of that. Um, a, uh, one of my best friends from medical school, who's the head of cancer at a well-known East Coast institution, he came down with Bell's palsy. 50, uh, 51 year old guy, uh, face dramatically affected. He still refuses to believe that that's what it was from. Yet I showed him, um, you know, obviously whether it's in, you know, vaccine adverse events reporting system about 
Bell's palsy. He sends me an article say, showing that, well, the risk of getting Bell's was higher in COVID patients than if you were, you know, than, than those who got the shot. In that same article, they talk about the randomized, you know, trial that showed seven cases of Bell's in the vaccine group, one in the control group. Not statistically significant, but, but, I said, but I said, you know, and even the authors comment that this needs to look into, but I said to my buddy who thought he was sending me an article saying, hey, COVID's worse. And I send him back. I said, oh my God, seven versus one. Um, in any case, I appreciate you uh, putting it out there and uh, know that for, you know, for sticking your head out, you know, you got a friend over here, that's for sure. Um, anywho, Dr. Stephen Gundry, uh, again, I could talk to you for hours, so much to unpack. I, you know, I didn't even go into how I'd love to insult cardiovascular uh, surgeons uh, and other cardiologists. Maybe we could do that at another time. You know, again, I think you'll agree. There's a time and a place for emergency medicine. There's a time and a oh, place yeah. for trauma and certain things we can't do. But again, when, when it comes to the prevention side of things, all of us medical doctors, we, you know, we, we graduate from our training with zero knowledge in actual prevention. So when you talk about nutrition, you talk in your book about sleep, you know, we talk about sunshine, environmental toxins, pollutants, uh, the pandemic of mold mycotoxicity, environmental toxins, the pesticides, all these things. So again, the more you and I get to educate people, the better. Uh, and again, thank you for being on this episode of the Healthy Heart Show. Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it, Jack. And uh, uh, good luck with your efforts. We'll, uh, we'll be out there uh, fighting the good fight, uh, hopefully. Thank you so much, Dr. Stephen Gundry. Uh, everyone, thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Healthy Heart Show. We'll come back with more information for you to help you on your path to the 100-year heart. Be well. That does it for today's episode. Thanks so much for listening to the Healthy Heart Show. Please help us get the word out by liking and subscribing to our podcast and our Facebook page, Natural Heart Doctor. Please show support for our podcast sponsor, Cardiology Coffee, your resource for organic, antioxidant-rich, mold and pesticide-free coffee shipped straight to your door. Learn more by adding at Cardiology Coffee on Instagram and visiting cardiologycoffee.com. This podcast provides materials for information and educational purposes only and should not be considered medical advice. We encourage you to contact your physician for any of the health issues discussed here.